talk about with regards to the, the connective tissue continuum. And we talked a lot about what our actual target tissue is. In the more popularized research, fascia has been the, the kind of new focus with regards to soft tissue treatment. And when I developed functional range release, the original intent was always to deal with a particular target tissue. Now, I use the term fascia to kind of in, in, um, encapsulate all of the tissues that I was targeting, but in retrospect, the way it's being used now, I probably wouldn't have necessarily targeted just that term, because what the actual target of functional range release is, is connective tissue. Now, fascia is a connective tissue, just like those other things I said are connective tissue. Um, tendons are connective tissues, capsules are connective tissues, um, epimecium, all of the fascial components and muscles are connective tissues, the ligaments are connective tissues, and as I was saying before, the only thing that separates a muscle becoming a tendon, it's not a, a new um, product, the only thing that kind of changes is the composition of the ground substance, cells, and fibers. So the percentages both within those, so the percentage of certain cells versus other cells, certain fibers versus, versus other fibers, more collagen, more elastin, different um, glycosaminoglycans, different uh, gags, different um, ground substance, that's what's going to differentiate a bone, which is a connective tissue, from a capsule, which is another connective tissue. So how do they go into each other? They go into each other by a very gradual flow. So you have a composition change going from a muscular type structure into a tendon type structure, into a bone or into a capsule or into a ligament. The moral of the story is, is that all of the targets making up connective tissue, like we said, come from the same precursor <laughs> cell. Fibroblasts are the, um, the precursor cell to all of the cells that will make up all of the connective tissue of your body. We said it before, tenocytes making tendons started at fibroblasts, desmocytes, um, osteoblasts, even um, chondroblasts making up cartilage is another form of connective tissue. So when we talk about the connective tissue continuum, it's a lot more extensive than we give it credit for. So there are things called myofascial chains which are also very popular in the, in, the, in the popular literature and in some of the scientific literature as well. We talk about anatomy trains, myofascial chains, which are, which, are, which are really, really good tools. But the one thing that I want to point out is that if we go too involved in studying the myofascial chains, so in other words, if we, we always think the dorsal sacral ligament is attached to the sacral tuberous ligament is attached to the biceps femoris, and you have a biceps femoris problem, therefore I have to treat the bicep femoris and everything else along that predetermined chain. We lose the, um, the extent of the soft tissue continuum because we are predetermining where lines of tension go. But if we understand that everything is connective tissue and everything is somewhat connected, lines of tension can go in various different directions. Okay? It doesn't have to go along a preset line. So it's funny because on one hand people are talking about the continuance of fascia and how it continues from top to bottom and it's all over the place, it goes in all different directions, but here's a predetermined cutout line of fascia going from the head to the toe. Well you just said it's, it's continu completely continuous everywhere, how can you tell me that it's only continuous in this, this line? The fact is it's, it's, it's not. There might have more thickenings of the connective tissue along a particular line, but my question is, is that myofascial chain developed and, and that kind of tells you how your anatomy functions or does the function you ask out of your anatomy develop the chain? Do you understand what that, what that means? So in other words, if I were to somehow be able to, di or to dissect a gymnast and a hockey player, would they have the same thickenings of all the chains or would the gymnast have a different composition than the hockey player? The gymnast would look different the gymnast would have developed different chains, chains that the hockey player might not even have had. <laughs> or, because everything's continuous, the gymnast might have a thicker, I don't know, posterior chain versus the hockey player's lateral chain. So your, your, your anatomy guides your function, but your function guides your anatomy. So if you look at a chart and they have the anatomy 
chains, they have like a dot and then a line going through a muscle and then another dot where it connects. Okay? You have to remember that when you're looking at one of these diagrams, this is a diagrammatic representation. There's no such thing as a dot and a line. So in other words, if this muscle is connected to this, it's not connected in a line. It's connected in an entire confluence of tissue. Just because we draw a line doesn't mean that's how it actually occurs. Which goes back to my original point that if you're treating, you have to know your chains, but you can't rely on your chains. You can't say that the chain is the whole chain is involved just because of the fact that the whole chain exists. Does that make sense? Now, the precursor cell is a very important thing to understand because the precursor cell, the way a fibroblast responds, we can extrapolate that to the way the other tissues will respond as well because they had the same precursor cell. So if you impart a mechanical load onto a fibroblast, a lot of great things happen. The fibroblasts tend to get a lot bigger, they tend to get more dendrites, they tend to start to align the deposition of collagen along the lines of your, your load. So these types of things you can think of when you're treating a tendon or when you're treating a capsule. When you're imparting a specific load into any tissue, the body will respond in kind. It'll respond by making it so whatever tissue you're loading is better able to accept the load. Okay? This is the whole basis for strength training. You give the body a stimulus that it's not used to. The body gets a little bit injured, a little bit damaged, and then the body responds to that stimulus by doing what? By hypertrophying the muscle or by adding more muscle. The same thing happens with any other tissue. Bone is a very good example. We talk about the, the stress lines in the hip. Those stress lines in the hip weren't always there. They're there because we walk. So we impart load into the, to the muscle, and then the body responds by changing or adapting so that the load is less, um, how do I say it, so that it can, it can better accept those loads. So when you're training in FRC, I'm going to be talking about you're not training just muscle. You're also training capsule. You're also training bone. You're also training tendon. You're also training ligament. You're training any connective tissue whose cell will respond to the new load application. And that changes things. So now when you go to the gym, you're not doing a, a hamstring workout. You're not doing a bicep workout. You're doing a movement workout. You're trying to adapt the body in such a way that it will allow a particular movement to occur more efficiently and with more quality of movement. So when you say, what are you training today? I'm not going to tell you a muscle. I'm going to tell you I'm training this particular movement. If you want me to go through all the connective tissues in the body that are being loaded as I do that movement, that's the only answer I can give you.